So, yesterday there was a hearing um, in regards to the gag order that was imposed um, on all information pertaining to Orrin and Orson West uh, during the investigation leading up to trial. Um, but, uh, but there was also interest in uh, CPS records and, you know, where the, where, at what point did the boys um, become a part of the system? Why, what happened? How many times were they visited? Was DHS on top of all that or CPS? And they refused to answer questions citing the, the gag order. And I know that this was also really uh, frustrating for the biological families also who are suing. That's one of the agencies that they're suing as well. And so um, yesterday the judge ruled that the gag order does not prevent release of DHS records in the Cal City Brothers case. So they were hiding behind that gag order. I know that the Californian, it's a Bakersfield paper, had requested information from CPS. Um, and they, they said no, they couldn't because of the gag order. And then I think the biological parents were, were given some other excuse why they couldn't retrieve those documents. Um, I'm not familiar with that. I know that CPS very seldom ever gives uh, publicly uh, any information from any case. They'll say, I remember Gabrielle Fernandez and um, those CPS agents involved were also brought under charges, but later the charges were dropped, unfortunately. Um, so, I, I, and I don't know why they were dropped. They never made it to court. And so we didn't hear about, about how CPS processed the information. And we didn't hear it here either. And it was a big concern for everybody that's followed this case from the very beginning. Um, and as we learn more and more about it, and we got to hear from the biological mom, the biological dad, um, the other extended biological family, and how suspicious the, the removal was. And uh, there, there were things floating around as to why. Um, it, it just, it didn't make a lot of sense um, to me, and I'm, I'm not involved in it, but it sure didn't make any sense to me and many others as well, but especially to the biological family. And that these two who already had four kids and living in an apartment had already adopted two, had two biological kids. And then, so of course there were questions, um, cause neither one of them worked. Um, I, you know, I always gave the adoptive parents the benefit of the doubt. Um, if they made enough money through uh, the state to stay home and give and, and both care for all six children, I supported that. That's where my mind went, was that, hey, why not? If you can afford to stay home and you're both hands on with your kids, um, do that. You know, you've got six, you've, you've just added two to your family and they're very young. Um, why not? But not realizing until later that there was probably some stuff going on that weren't, wasn't good for the kids. And here, but I always like to just put the benefit of the doubt out there um, first. And I, like I said, I, at first I had no reason to not believe the parents that the kids 
random you know, kids took off. And all I could think about was the dangers that were out there and they didn't know the neighborhood. And, and I think everybody felt that way. That's why in this neighborhood, 11 o'clock at night, people were out. They looked like zombie nation. There were people everywhere looking for them in the dark on dirt bike, by truck, by foot, by foot, by um, ATV. But anyway, let me, let's get into this because I found this, uh, this argument by CPS. Um, so this is by the Californian, by Shani um, Desai. A Kern County Superior Court judge clarified a gag order Wednesday issued in the California City Brothers Adoptive Parents murder trial and agreed with the Californian stance. A gag order doesn't bar the release of records requested by this newspaper about the brothers' interactions with social workers. Despite this ruling by Judge uh, Charles Bremer, some records the Californian seeks are banned from public review after a juvenile court judge issued a protective order to limit disseminating documents. But the Kern County Department of Human Services did disclose some information Wednesday after Bremer's ruling that law enforcement determined in July 2022 that both boys died from abuse. The Californian asked the Kern County Department of Human Services on January 23rd for documents pursuant to California Senate Bill 39 in relation to Orrin 4 and Orson 3. Police reports against whom the abuse or neglect was substantiated, health care records reflecting a pattern of abuse or neglect, risk and safety assessments, and other records are required to be disclosed under SB 39 if a child dies. And that SB 39, I've talked about that before, that is in place so that Department of Human Services has a watchdog, that they have some oversight, but they fight it all the time. The West toddlers were reported missing from California City by their adoptive parents, Trezell and Jacqueline West, in December 2020. A little more than a year later, both parents were indicted and have pleaded not guilty to two second-degree murder charges, an involuntary manslaughter charge, willful cruelty to a child, conspiracy, and falsely reporting an emergency. Kern DHS senior paralegal Edda Sharp denied the Californian records pursuant to SB 39 on February 14th, claiming a gag order imposed by a trial court judge on the criminal case sealed records, including documents that may be in our agency's possession. Sharp wrote in an email, quote, I am unable to release any information at this time related to your request. After publishing a story about this denial, this reporter sent another letter to County Council and Kern DHS demanding the release of records because a blanket gag order enacted by a trial court judge doesn't trump a law decided for the entire state. The language plainly states records are mandated to be released upon request, this reporter wrote. The second letter spurred a hearing requested by County Council asking Judge Bremer to clarify the gag order because lawyers weren't present when it was implemented and they didn't want to unlawfully release information. County Council also sought to protect the prosecution's case and the defendant's substantial constitutional rights, according to Deputy County Counsel Brian Walters. Bremer, who is also presiding over the West trial, said during a hearing Wednesday, yesterday, 
the county wasn't bound by the gag order and could release information lawfully allowed to be disclosed. Because there was no written gag order issued, Bremer stepped in to provide clarification. The request by the Bakersfield Californian is not restrained by this court in any way, Bremer said. However, the Kern County District Attorney's Office objected to releasing documents because their dissemination could jeopardize an ongoing criminal proceeding. According to a letter issued Wednesday by DHS Senior Paralegal Sharp, SB 39 allows Kern DHS to redact information if it determines disclosure could harm a criminal investigation or proceeding. They obviously don't know the SB 39 like they should, or they do, and they are deliberately The information revealed Wednesday was limited. The boys died in the home of a parent or legal guardian from abuse. Not neglect, the newly disclosed record said. There was also an investigation by law enforcement and child welfare services, probation, though it wasn't known when the boys died, the record said. First Amendment and free speech proponents were pleased with Bremer's clarification that this gag order doesn't preempt a statute mandating a disclosure of records. The court's ruling helpfully clarifies the scope of its gag order, which should never have been invoked to block access to public records under California's public records law. Gunita Singh, a staff attorney with Nonprofit Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, wrote in an email, Exemptions to disclosure under the public records law must always be narrowly construed, and the agency's invocation of a gag order from an entirely separate branch of government contravenes this cardinal rule. But there's still an issue with broad mandates blocking speech, according to advocates. This gag order violates the First Amendment. This law generally guarantees the right to speak about issues of public concern, and parties in a criminal case have a right to speak out, said David Loy, the legal director with the First Amendment Coalition. Nothing is more of a public concern than a high-profile criminal case, Loy said. Established case law clearly states alternative methods to ensuring a fair trial must be adopted rather than a sweeping silencing order. <coughs> Excuse me. If both accomplish the same goal, Loy said. If the goal is to ensure a fair trial, Prospective jurors could be extensively questioned to ensure they've not stumbled across new stories about the case, and if they have, they can be excused. As a last resort, a high-profile trial could be moved to another county. <coughs> Excuse me. You may not silence people from speaking about something if there's any less restrictive means to accomplish whatever interest you're trying to serve, Loy added. Juvenile court cases are typically held in secret. SB 39's intent is to prevent harm from coming to other children cared by DHS or who will be in the future care of DHS by revealing documents showing what government employees did or didn't do to ensure a child's safety according to the law. And, and that's exactly the point of the SB 39. Um, it's some measure of accountability and they've they you know to think that child services doesn't know what SB 39 means and that they needed clarification on this gag order um i i don't believe that i don't believe that you know dhs cps child services whatever they have come under a lot of scrutiny out here they have come under uh intense fire 
and people don't understand why they aren't held accountable. You know, why was the Gabrielle Fernandez the first case where they were charged with something? And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that that never happened. They never, you know, went through with it. Um, There are, you know, guardian ad litems. I was a guardian ad litem in North Carolina, and you have to be appointed to do that. You get training to do that. You're appointed to do that. And as a guardian ad litem, um, you are the voice of the kids in all concerns, between the parents, between the courts, between DHS. As a guardian ad litem, you speak for them that can't speak for themselves. And, <clears throat> you know, you get to know the children, you get to know the families, um, you, the, the guardian ad litem is supposed to do sort of their own, um, you know, investigation uh, with neighbors, with uh, family, so on and so forth, and, and just speak on behalf of the kids. You know, what's the best thing? You go to court, you talk to the judge, that's not going to be healthy for the kids. Um, you speak for the you speak for the kids when it comes to family. No, I I don't think going with that family member would be a good idea. And you do everything you can if it's at all possible. And the kids, um, I I just have a I almost feel like that's so necessary to have a a guardian ad litem when kids are removed from from the home because CPS is one they're they're of one mind and they think one way from one perspective the courts think from another perspective the families think from another perspective so who who can think from the child's perspective and and that's where the guardian ad litem comes in and uh i think that this cps out here uh just like with most it, the the fact that they have stalled and stalled and stalled and it took a judge to release that little bit of information that they died by abuse in the home of their uh guardian um or parent um not neglect it's they were not they didn't die from the neglect they died from the abuse in the home um but concerning to me is what did CPS do up to that, that point? It was obvious in the affidavit number two, there were some interactions um, there's a lot all the names are redacted, but there was interactions that from so and so, calling and and you know the person in the home uh parent or legal guardian saying yes he's here yes he's here um and and that that should all you know come out in court and i i don't know what role cps is going to play in the hearing i know that there's these separate lawsuits happening um, but you can redact names and release how many times these kids were visited by CPS in person, how many times, uh, what was discovered during home inspection, um, how did the kids react to CPS? Did they notice, you know, any marks on them or any behavior that would indicate that they were uh, being abused? Did the kids say anything about being abused? Um, what about the other two kids? I don't know if they continued once the two children were adopted in a court of law, but what happened up to the adoption? you know, exactly what was going on up to the adoption. Do they follow up with the family once the adoption takes place? Because they were adopted officially 
pretty quickly after they were placed in their care for uh, fostering, I believe. I'd have to go back and look at all the dates and stuff that I have, but but that court case, um, when the biological uh, mom and dad, when they and and I believe that the grandparents are a part of the lawsuit as well, and they're two individual lawsuits. When they proceed with their invest with their lawsuit, I'm not sure if that will even hit the light of day. Um, I, I, I doubt that will be public, but I, I don't see why not. The, the caseworkers with Gabriel Fernandez, their names were released and when they were sued um, as being their caseworkers, you know, we all knew who they were by name and and by face, so I'm not sure. But so this little snippet of information, I'm sure doesn't doesn't make the biological family um, it, any, it, it certainly doesn't, man, if I was any part of that biological family, I would be spitting nails. I mean, they're already so frustrated and hurt and angry, but imagine hearing that they died by abuse of their adoptive parents. And, you know, um, the biological mother, her, la her last name is Dean, I believe. And, and I just, I'm sorry, I can't remember her first name, but she, it, from everything that she has said publicly and her and the dad has said publicly of the Orrin and Orson, which they named classic and sincere, they're just, there was a rush to remove these kids like rush 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 and you realize that agents with cps every time they remove a child from the house they get a bonus you get a monetary bonus thousands of dollars that was the case the last time i looked you can go on youtube and look up uh corrupt cps and there's a, there's there's a lot of um information about these bonuses and once the child is removed from the home there's very little incentive like the big bonus when you remove a child there's very little incentive for them to to keep checking on the child or to there's no more bonuses if you remove the child from an adopt adoptive home you know that you place them with you don't get anything for that um, and I just think monetizing child protective services like that um, is a huge mistake. It's a huge red flag. And once the child is, there's also a separate system when you, when you are court mandated to pay child support and they attach your wages and all that stuff, that's a, that's a separate that's not CPS anymore. It's a contracted agency that comes after the parent for the money. And it's out of the hands of CPS, that whole exchange of, of child support and whatnot and how much and, or the collection of the money is, at least that's the, the last I looked in, looked into it. That's how the system was rigged. But, um, Nevertheless, this is very sad, even though most of us suspected um, and, and um, the biological mother had said, you know, during her, you know, before they were adopted, she was told she had to do certain things to get them back and she visited them often. She posted a bunch of pictures and videos and has talked um, so much about these boys and they really always looked happy to be with her and to see her. And I can see what she's saying that over time she noticed um, things and did bring it to the CPS attention that the kids looked like they weren't eating. 
like there were marks on uh, on the children and um, she also um, at that time wanted to know like what was going on and um, so but her situation is separate from all of this she was in pursuit of getting her kids back when they release them for adoption and that's what's going to be battled out in court and now that this has been released that they were actually abused so i believe they both are going to argue these kids were not abused in my home they there was such a rush to remove them and would not work with me trying to do all the things that were required of us and they died by abuse in a home they placed them in you know so only the parents and the families that had interaction with them really know um, how that went down i know that they are going to of course when that goes to court i don't know how much of that will be released um, if that'll be public because a lot of these uh, CPS cases, when it involves children, they they are um, private. So, but there should be the release of information in its entirety too. So another sad piece to the puzzle. Um, we all kind of suspected, I believe, once once we all, and I think I was a late late to the to the belief that the parents had done anything to them. It was in the back of my mind, the, the adoptive parents, but I was kind of like not knee jerk reacting that they had anything to do with it. And and then you try to, uh, I did anyway, imagine what, how, what went on in the home with six small children under all under the age of 10 at the time. And they just moved into a new home. Um, those the the dynamics of bringing in. Um, I, I I don't. They're just doesn't. I don't know, but. Uh, The counseling, like were they counseled? Were were they counseled as a family? Um, blending their families. Uh, it's it's you know these two children know their mom and they know their dad, their biological mom and dad. And every time they were, take, were taken after visiting back to the West, they probably wanted their mom. You know, I mean, you, that that bond is is uh, really hard. You know, and and like I said, I have no idea, but I just do know that the biological family is distraught. They have they've been out on the searches with us. Um, they've been instrumental in getting the word out and talking to um, YouTubers with huge platforms who can um, promote uh, the case, move it along, talk about their these babies and try in any way, shape or form to to be heard and get justice for them. This is so sad. But anyway, that's the article.